OK, it has been a busy budget week in Canberra, as we all know. A little earlier today, I caught up with the opposition leader. Peter Dutton, thank you so much for joining me on what is a very busy morning after a very busy night, I know. I'll get to your budget reply shortly, but first up, Labor's budget, the biggest failure in your eyes. Well, Erin, I think it was uh, leaving millions of Australians behind. Uh, the fact is we've got a working poor in our country now and there are many people who are turning up to work, uh, maybe both in the household are working long hours and they just can't make their balance uh, their budget balance and, and I, I think we underestimate how many people sadly tragically are in that situation and likely to be longer in that situation because all of the economic experts are saying that the budget will keep inflation higher for longer. But haven't Labor traditionally marketed themselves as the party for working class Australians? Well I think that's what's hurt a lot of people because the expectation was that there would be assistance in this budget. The government decisions that they've made that's what's resulted in the inflation problem that we've got. The government wants you to believe that it's all about Russia going into Ukraine, but the reality is that our core inflation here is higher than any G7 nation. And that means the problem is of a domestic nature. And I think there are a lot of families, as you rightly point out, working class families, who thought that Labor would come in to provide support in this budget, and there's been none of it. And not only that, from the 1st of July, 10 million Australians on incomes of $126,000 or less will be on average about $1,500 a year worse off. So the problem is only compounded uh, over the course of this year. And also in the budget papers, which the Treasurer forgot to mention in his speech on Tuesday night, electricity prices will go up by about $500 again over the next 12 months. Well, that is not what they promised us during the election campaign. Well, it's not. And there are about 12 election promises that have been broken just within this first year and there's still a lot of scepticism around whether they will adopt the stage three tax cuts that we legislated when we were in government. Uh, if not, then that will be a further blow to, uh, to many, many Australians who are thinking that there's at least a bit of relief coming down the, down the line. Yes, changing that could be shut down fairly definitively. They know how to do that, but they're choosing not to, which is worrying for well, more than a few people. Congratulations on your budget reply last night. How does your plan address the failures in Labor's? Well, Erin, I hope that we spelled out last night uh, some of the, the, the way in which we would approach the problem in a market where we've got uh, almost you know, 440,000 job vacancies, we've got over 800,000 people uh, on unemployment benefits and the government's proposition was to increase the base payment by $40 a fortnight. Some people would say that that would provide a further incentive to stay on that welfare payment instead of getting into one of those jobs. Our approach was to say, well, let, let's allow people to work an extra shift or two to earn more than the $40 but through their own efforts and the introduction to that job might lead to a third or fourth or fifth shift or maybe full-time work because there are plenty of businesses who just can't get people to fill those vacancies. OK, let's take a look at some of the measures that you do actually support that were in Labor's budget, like the raising of aged care wages, uh, things like that, Medicare as well. Why didn't the Coalition do more in those spaces when you were in government? We invested about $30 billion into aged care. But the aged care system in our country, you know, to be honest, has been broken for decades. Uh, Scott Morrison commissioned the Royal Commission into aged care. Uh, the problems had been there in the Howard years, in the Rudd years, in the Gillard years, in the Abbott and Turnbull years. Uh, it's a problem of an ageing population. It's a problem of expectation within our society. Uh, obviously, we've got many cases of people uh, being diagnosed with early dementia. Uh, I, I want a dignified, respectful aged care system. And it does cost money, but there's no magic pudding for it. The money either comes from the government or it comes from people who are going into the aged care system. And we need to make sure that the money's spent efficiently as well. So I think there's a debate there that um, we can have with the government to see what sensible reforms they might have that we could support. And uh, it makes it more sustainable. And I think uh, it's a more respectful system if we do that.
Now, I do want to compliment you on your pledge to put the number of subsidised psychologist visits back up to 20. Your government increased it during the pandemic. Labor has decreased it back down to 10. This is really, really important stuff. I was listening to some criticism of it from the government this morning, saying that it would cost around 100 million. In my eyes, uh, that is something that, uh, that is worth paying. Uh, well, th thanks, Erin. Um, you know, and, and there's, uh, you know, many stories we hear across the country. Uh, when, when we were in government, we increased the number of services from 10 up to 20. And for people to get well and to deal with their mental health issues, they need that level of contact with their psychologist. The problems in many cases just aren't, aren't resolved or people aren't put onto a better pathway after 10 sessions. And I must say that I, I was amazed when the government reduced it from 20 down to 10. Uh, and I'd made my mind up a, a fair while ago, to be honest, that I would increase it back to 20. Uh, and I thought the government would rectify the problem on Tuesday night, and I was surprised, to be honest, that they didn't. So we made the announcement in the budget reply speech last night to increase the number of sessions from 10 to 20. Uh, Mark Butler, the health minister, is out today saying that that's lazy policy. I just don't know what that means because the people I've spoken to uh, in, you know, as patients and, and uh, the clinicians, the, they think it's essential. And I, just, I don't want an Australia where we're leaving those people behind. Uh, I want to make sure that we can provide them with support to help them get better. And I, I, I think the, the Health Minister's comments this morning uh, were insensitive and, uh, and I think disrespectful of those people who have been calling for this change. Final thing before I let you go, and this one, to be honest, really surprised me. And as you know, I hosted Rugby League on Channel 9 for 10 years. I know a hell of a lot about sports betting ads. And look, there were times when I would get frustrated with how many there were. There was a period where they were almost disguised as being part of the commentary, and then that was stopped, which I think it needed to be absolutely, and it was made very clear that they were ads. I know firsthand that people have some serious gambling problems and addictions that ruin their lives, but I also know that more people can do this sensibly. This policy really did surprise me. Are you looking to make gambling like alcohol and cigarettes when it comes to advertising in sport? And, and why does this deserve such a focus and why is this the answer to the gambling problem? Well, Erin, I, I, I thought it was the right thing to do for families. Uh, you know, I, I'm happy to have a punt like uh, most people and do it responsibly. Um, but I don't want to sit there with my 15-year-old or 16-year-old son or daughter during a sports match and for the conversation to be dominated by a discussion on multis and odds and who's going to score a first try and uh, it, it takes away from the experience and from uh, what should be an enjoyable family time. I just think footy time's family time and we, we've said that for an hour before a game starts until an hour after the game finishes that should be the period where you can just watch the game in peace. Uh, instead of being bombarded with ad after ad after ad. And I think there's a sense of balance that's required here. And I also think there is an element of a cultural shift in Australia, which we need to be very conscious of. Uh, you see kids being exposed to gambling and the normalisation of gambling. Uh, that, that creates a culture where kids do develop a, a habit of gambling at an early age, and it continues. And as you point out, for many people, uh, they can handle it, it can be dealt with responsibly, but for a lot of people, uh, they end up um, in a very difficult situation. And I, I want the interaction uh, between parents in particular and their kids when you're sitting down to, you know, have a pizza on a Friday night. Um, I, I want it to be a discussion about the game or what you did during your day. I don't want it to be dominated by, you know, the latest um, multi uh, discussion. And that's, you know, I think that's the view of. A lot of Australians, and if some people aren't happy with that, well, um, you know, I'm not, not setting out to upset them, but uh, I just think in the leadership position you need to make decisions that are in the best interest of our country, and, and I believe that this is. Oh, it's interesting, and, and look, I understand what you're saying, absolutely, but... New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet took gambling as one of his big issues to the election, and we all know how that turned out. It just felt to me like it, it didn't cut through at all. He didn't sell it to families in a way that was, that was effective or, you know, swayed their vote, so to speak. But anyway, we'll watch with interest. I think trying to tackle it is super important. I don't know if your solution is the right way forward, but 
We'll wait and see. Uh, opposition leader, thank you so very much for joining me. Appreciate it. Nice to catch up. Thank you.